Chapter Sixteen of Poison Romance and Poison Mysteries by Charles John Samuel Thompson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Sixteen: Opium Eating and Smoking, Mescal Buttons. The narcotic properties of the poppy have been known from times of great antiquity. The first mention we have of its use is by Theophrastus, who lived about three hundred years B.C. It is supposed that the potion known under the name of Nepenthe, prepared by Helen of Troy, and given to the guests of Menelaus, to drive away their care, was none other than a wine of opium. This conjecture receives support from Homer, who states that Nepenthe was obtained from Thebes, the ancient capital of Egypt. According to Prosper Alpinus, the Egyptians were practised opium-eaters, and were often faint and languid through the want of it. They prepared and drank it in the form of cretic wine, which they flavoured and made hotter by the addition of pepper and other aromatics. The Turks and Persians employed opium as a medicine, and also for eating, from a very early period. Dioscorides, the ancient Greek pharmacist, describes how the capsules from which the drug is collected should be cut, and Celsus, a Roman physician of the first century, frequently alludes to opium in his works under the quaint name of poppy tears. The introduction of opium into India seems to have been connected with the spread of Mohammedanism, the earliest record we have of its use in that country being made by Barbosa in 1511, although it is more than probable it was used in India long before that time. Pires, the first ambassador from Europe to China in 1516, speaks of the opium of Egypt, Cambay, and the kingdom of Kus in Bengal and states it was eaten by the kings and lords, and even the common people, though not so much because it costs dear. The Mughal government uniformly sold the opium monopoly, and the East India Company did likewise. The properties of opium have also been known from early times to the Persians, who flavoured the drug with aromatics, and held it in great esteem. By them it was commonly called theriaca. It is supposed to have been first introduced to China by the Arabs, who traded with the Chinese as early as the ninth century. Towards the end of the eighteenth century, a trade sprang up with India, which rapidly increased till it led to political difficulties, culminating in the War of 1842 and the signing of the Treaty of Nanking, after which five ports of China were opened to foreign trade opium being admitted as a legalized import in 1858. Opium smoking in China was practiced in the 17th century, and gradually extended over the entire empire, and at the present time is almost a recognized habit among the people. With regard to the introduction of opium into India, the Mohammedans, once having established its use, began to make it a source of income. The great mogul monopolized the opium production and trade, and derived an immense income from the sale of the monopoly. With respect to its use in India, it is not easy to state with certainty whether or not, and in what periods, it has increased over the various parts of the country. From the most recent reports, it appears that the largest amount of opium is produced in the central tract of the Ganges, extending from Dinapur in the east to Agra in the west, and from Gurkapur in the north to Hazrariba in the south, and comprising an area of about 600 miles long and 200 miles broad. In the district of Bengal, the government has the monopoly of the opium industry, and the districts are divided into two agencies, Bihar and Benares, which are under the control of officers residing at Patna and Ghazipur. In 1883, the amount of acres under poppy cultivation was in Bihar 463,829, and in Benares Agency, 412,625. But the export of opium has somewhat diminished since then. Anyone may undertake the industry, 
but cultivators are obliged to sell the opium exclusively to the government agencies at a price which is fixed beforehand by the officials the government sells the ready goods to merchants at a much higher price which difference is paid by the country to which the opium is exported in india itself the sale of opium is restricted to licensed shopkeepers a practice which has proved to be useful because in some places when the licensed shops have been closed a greater number of unlicensed and secret shops have sprung up and have made the contract insufficient the opium question is so complex in its nature and is so largely influenced by the habit and constitution of those nations who are addicted to its use that it is obvious that only those with skilled medical knowledge who are on the spot and have lived and had a daily experience of the people are in a proper position to deal with the question at all so much has been written by religious enthusiasts and other persons totally ignorant of the nature and properties of the drug that one almost hesitates to touch upon the question at all our only excuse for so doing is that the following facts have been furnished by reliable medical authorities who are really in a position to judge on the subject the cause which led to the use of this narcotic drug by the races of the east may have been primarily due to the prohibition of wine by the moslems but more likely on account of its valuable remedial or protective properties needed by a race subject to malaria and kindred diseases and to counteract the effect of the hot climate to which they are exposed it is a remedy at hand and would seem to be one to which they at once fly the evil lies more in the smoking than the eating of the drug the former habit is more prevalent in china and has the most demoralizing effect the extent of its use in the east varies according to the geographical and social differences of the people and it is used in various degrees of moderation and excess the drug is employed in various forms according to the class of people who consume it in india it is largely used in the crude state and is sold at about two annas a drachma in small square pieces the opium eater will take two or three grains and roll them into the form of a pill between his fingers and then chew or swallow it often twenty times in the day it is also used in a liquid form called kasumba made by macerating opium in rose water others boil it with milk then collect the cream and eat it the varieties for smoking are known as chundo and mudat the former being a very impure extract of a fairly stiff consistence and the latter made from the refuse of chundo of which it largely consists but being much cheaper is chiefly used by the low-class hindus and mohammedans from two to four grains a day may be called a moderate use of the crude drug the poorer people regularly give it to children up to two years of age to keep them quiet also as a preventive against such complaints as enteritis so common in the east and so before youth is reached they become inured to its action licenses to sell the drug are sold to the highest bidder at the opium auctions the licensee having the privilege of supplying a certain number of small dealers the chinese smoker usually lays himself down on his side with his head supported by a pillow on the straw mat beside him between his doubled-up knees and his nose a small glass oil lamp covered with a glass shade is burning close to this is a tray containing a small round box holding the drug a straight piece of wire used for manipulating it a knife to scrape up fragments and the pipe used for smoking the latter is about two feet long with a bore of about half an inch in diameter and is not unlike the stem of a flute before it is fitted about two inches from the bottom of the tube is a closed cup or bowl of earthenware or stone having a central perforation to charge the pipe a small portion of the drug weighing a few grains is picked up with the wire kneaded and rolled in the closed surface of the cup then heated in the flame of the lamp till it swells 
This is rolled up and again manipulated, then finally placed in the aperture in the surface of the bowl. It is then lighted from the lamp and the smoke drawn into the lungs through the tube till the first charge is exhausted. In a report made by the British Medical Journal concerning the use of opium in India, from the evidence of medical men long resident in that country, there seems a general consensus of opinion that opium-eating, in the majority of cases, exercises no unfavorable influence on the people who indulge in the habit, and that it is a prophylactic against fever, and prevents the natives from malaria and excessive fatigue. There is no comparison between the effects of the opium habit and the habitual use of alcohol. English people cannot judge from their own standard the manners and customs of people living under conditions with which they are unacquainted. While we look on opium as a narcotic, the Hindu uses it as a stimulant to enable him to go through hard work on the smallest quantity possible of food. In Persia, at the present time, according to Wills, nine out of ten of the aged take from one to five grains of the drug daily. It is largely used by the native physicians. It does not appear that the moderate use of Persian opium in the country itself is deleterious. Opium smoking is almost unknown, and when it is smoked, it is, as a rule, by a doctor's orders. The opium pill-box, a tiny box of silver, is as common in Persia as the snuff-box was once among us. Most men of forty in the middle and upper classes use it. They take from a grain to a grain and a half, divided into two pills, one in the afternoon and one at night. The majority of authorities agree that opium smoking as a habit is much more harmful and attended with more demoralizing influences than opium eating. But either habit is undoubtedly harmful to Europeans, and when once formed, is extremely difficult to break. Paracelsus is generally credited with being the originator of the word laudanum, which is now employed as the popular name for tincture of opium. Yet there seems little doubt the word was first applied to the gum of the cystus. Clusius, in his Rariorum Plantarum Historiae, states, The gum of the cystus is called in Greek and Latin laudanum, and in shops laudanum. It is therefore very likely that the secret preparation originated by Paracelsus, which he called laudanum, was composed of the gum of the cystus as well as opium, and that he adopted the title from the former ingredient. The Kiowa and other Mexican Indians used the fruit of the Anhelonium luini, which they called mescal buttons, to produce a species of intoxication and stimulation during certain of their religious ceremonies. The effects of this fruit, which like Indian hemp varies considerably in different individuals, are very peculiar, and have been described by Lewin, Prentice, and Morgan. The eating of the fruit first results in a state of strange excitement and great exuberance of spirits, accompanied by great volubility in speech. This is shortly followed by a stage of intoxication, in which the sight is affected in a very extraordinary manner, consisting of a kaleidoscopic play of colors, ever in motion, of every possible shade and tint, and these constantly changing. The pupils of the eyes are widely dilated, cutaneous sensation is blunted, and thoughts seem to flash through the brain with extraordinary rapidity. The color visions are generally only seen with closed eyes, but the coloring of all external objects is exaggerated. Sometimes there is also an indescribable sensation of dual existence. Recent investigation into the pharmacology of the mescal plant proved it to be a poison of a very powerful nature. Lethal doses produce a complete paralysis, and death is caused by respiratory failure. End of chapter 16